Turn to James chapter 1. We are going to begin our series on the gospel, uh, of uh, James, rather, the law of liberty. Um, and we're just going to work our way through that text, through the, through the book of James in the next few weeks. Um, there's a whole lot to say on faith and wisdom and, and how to apply a faith for all of life and James's understanding of the law of liberty. So um, we want to uh, just kind of piece through that as we go. So wisdom and trials is what we're going to cover today. So go ahead and hold your your finger there in James 1. I'm going to pray, and then we'll just work our way through it. Our Father and most gracious God, we ask and pray that you would would open our hearts, open our minds, so that your Spirit will give us understanding, give us application, give us help, and most importantly, cultivate joy within us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, James chapter 1, 1 through 8. I'm going to read it through and then go back through it and we'll just pull out a few things, keywords, and then we'll uh, we'll apply it. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So James, James is the writer, he's the author of it. James is the brother of Jesus. This is not the James, the brother of John, who was executed by Herod in Acts chapter two or Acts chapter 12, verse two. Um, and it's interesting because in the New Testament there are four different James characters. Um, you, James is also, the, him being the brother of Jesus, he was the one, one of the persons that the resurrected Christ appeared to. He's listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. Paul, he called James a pillar of the church in Galatians 2, 9. James is a pillar of the church. And a lot of times we don't give James a whole lot of credit. We usually think of Paul. He's the missionary, the apostle, you know, the gospel to the world. And then we do think of Peter often because Peter was also there um, in the early church. But James is, is also there. He's a pillar, pillar of the church. Paul saw James on his first post-conversion visit to Jerusalem. That's in Galatians 1.19. When Paul became a Christian, uh, he spent some time uh, alone, if you will, in study for many years, three years. But, but after his conversion and his visit to Jerusalem, he saw James. And interestingly enough, in Acts 21 verse 18, James was also seen by Paul in Jerusalem on Paul's last visit to Jerusalem. Because at that point, uh, Paul was going to be arrested and sent to Rome for trial. In Acts 12, 17, Peter told his friends to go and tell James about his prison release. James is an important character. The, the first Christian council in Jerusalem was led by James. That's Acts chapter 15, verse 13. And then, of course, we know from the book of Jude, Jude verse 1, that uh, Jude was the brother of James. So this, this James is the brother of Jesus. Mary and Joseph presumably had other children after Jesus, and James was one of them. And this person, this author, was martyred in the early 60s. Um, there's debate on that, but probably around 62 AD is the time frame for that. So James, he's a bondservant of God, he says in verse 1, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a slave to God and Christ. They are the same, right? The, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he says, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. The twelve tribes were, um, it's kind of code language. Now, it is interesting, one thing I didn't mention with regard to James. If you read in, in, in the Greek text, it's actually Jacob. James is the Hellenized version, the Greek version. So there's obviously a theme here. He's saying Jacob to the 12 tribes. Jacob, of course, his name was changed, if you remember, in the Old Testament to Israel. So he was the father, if you will, of those 12 tribes. So there's like clearly a connection here early on for James. 
they were the Jewish Christians spread abroad after the stoning of Stephen. If you remember, Stephen was brought before um, a mob, if you will, and, and Saul was there, and Stephen was stoned after his preaching, a remarkable sermon, by the way. You, you should read that in Acts. It's just a, a history of Israel. But he preaches this sermon, and then, of course, he's stoned to death, and he looks up, and Jesus is standing and essentially welcomes Stephen into his presence after his death. So this, this Jacob, this James, is basically, he's, he's writing a letter to Jewish Christians who are all over the place. When Stephen was stoned, there was this scattering abroad of people. Verse 2, Consider it all joy. The word joy. Joy is simply the state of spirit-given Christ-focused, what I would call quieted contentment in all circumstances. A, it's, joy is a state of spirit-given, Christ-focused, quieted contentment in all circumstances. Think of the language of the waves. Some of us remember the ocean recently and the waves. It's, it's a stillness. In the book of Revelation, the sea is a glassy sea. We even just sang about that in, in the Holy, Holy, Holy song. That is the quieted of the nations. The nations are no longer in an uproar. They have been subdued by Christ. So this contentment in all circumstances. And he says to consider it joy when you encounter various trials. Trials here is used as basically external threats, which includes, of course, persecution. But it can be any sort of suffering, any sort of circumstance where things are not uh, the way you may want them to be. Things that are adverse to your current state of mind. Things are um, maybe not going the way you want. You're in a season of difficulty, um, feeling frustrated about, about things. These are the trials. He says, consider it joy. And the reason, he says in verse 3, is because knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Testing, that word is simply the criterion for proving the quality or genuineness of something. Proving something to be, whether or not it's up to par, whether or not it's, it's good in quality. And then he says, it's a testing of what? Your faith. What is faith? Well, we'll get to that in the, in the next few chapters, of course. James, a lot of people are frustrated with James because, you know, Paul will say, we're justifi justified by faith alone. And James says, we're not justified by faith alone. And then people say, well, they're obviously at odds. There was a contradiction in terms. Well, there's not. There's a nuance to them, as we'll see as we get going. So testing of your faith gives the result of endurance. Endurance, some of your translations would say steadfastness or preservation. And actually, the literal Greek meaning is to remain under something, to remain under. And it's the idea of, this is kind of my own definition, but it's like a hopeful obstinance towards circumstances or trials. You see a trial and you're obstinately hopeful. It's not like a passive thing where you know oh, I'm just going to choose to be happy when you're depressed and out of it. No, it's it, it's an aggressive obstinance of in being in pursuit of hope towards something. You're remaining under the control of hope and joy in that moment. So that's kind of the the word picture. Verse four. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The word perfect, teleos, it means simply the goal of something. The, it's, its purpose is full and complete. Um, we think of the word telos as like the end, like Jesus is the end of the law, as if, well, it stops and then everything after is you know, not applicable. It's not so much that. When Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, which is a different Greek word, pleuro, he simply means he brought it to its perfect state. Uh, there, there were certain imperfections about the Old Testament law that were pointing to Jesus, specifically the ceremonial aspects. And, and upon him, of course, he, he perfects it. He brings it to its appointed consummation, if you will. It is now in effect. And, and this idea is the same here. Um, perfect or mature. He says perfect and complete. For something to be complete is for it to be whole. It's not lacking in something. It has all the parts. It's the idea of a puzzle. You have all the pieces, and they're right in the place they're supposed to be. And of course, I think what James is hinting at is, of course, before the fall in Adam and Eve, there was a perfection of mankind in a sense of a maturity. So we don't believe, there are some who would teach, 
Christian perfectionism, as in, we, you know, we, we, you're going to reach a state of never sinning ever anymore in history. And I, some of the holiness groups that teach that, I just, I don't see that. I, I see a maturity, a growth process, and the subduing of sin through constant repentance, constant trust, constant maturity, but I don't see anything being perfection in the usual way that we talk about perfection. Verse 5, but if any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you lacks wisdom, wisdom is the skill in the affairs of life. It's knowledge applied. You can know something, but the wise person knows it and does it. He's consistent with all the way through. Um, you might really insight from God is, of course, the start of that. God is infinitely wise. But if you lack this, if you don't have the ability to skillfully navigate life in certain areas, you should ask God. He gives it generously without reproach. Reproach is basically this idea that God does not disparage in giving us wisdom. He's not bothered by it. So ask him. Verse 6, but, it, but this person has to ask in faith without any doubting. Doubting is this idea of separate, separate you, you separate yourself from something. There's this idea of striving with your own self. Doubt is, is hesitation in your mind. It's, it's wavering about in your life like the boat on the s- stormy seas. So don't, don't doubt. Don't, don't be like the, the waves of the sea that just go here and fro. He, he, we're supposed to be faithful. Verse 7, For that man ought not to expect to assume or judge that he will receive anything from the Lord. Don't be double-minded in your pursuit of wisdom and joy in trials. Being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The, the two words are actually quite literally double-minded means... Um, twice in soul put together. It's this divided loyalties idea. You're doubtful. You're, you're wavering. Your life is marked by constant hemming and hawing, indecisiveness, indecision. You lack certainty. You, you want, this person wants um, a lot of God, uh, uh, just enough of God, but not too much of God. That's a double-minded man. Unstable, meaning you're unsettled, you're unsteady. You're basically marked by gen, general disorderliness in your life. That's, the, that's what James is getting at. So, what do, we, what do we do with a text like this? Well, this text is highly personal for me because I had a difficult week, which is hilarious given the fact that there was so much traction on the vaccine sermon. <laughs> it's just funny. It's funny how God will use things that you're studying to basically crush you with it to make sure that you know. Whenever we... Uh, Whenever we go to the Bible, obviously, we need to keep in mind the historical context. We need to, we need to keep in mind the background. James is writing to, to Christians in general, yes, but he's really writing to Jewish Christians in particular. And all of these people were scattered abroad all around the Middle East, basically because of the powder keg that had become the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a hotbed for political anarchy. It was a hotbed for um, contentiousness with Rome. It had become a terrible place to be. And now, of course, you don't have to look very far. Just look at the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we know that persecution broke out like crazy. And many Jewish Christians, they, they fled. They, had no, they weren't welcome to be there anymore. And the reason, I think, I think it's obvious from the book of Acts, the reason that this happened was for the advancement of the gospel in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. God was using these trials, these persecutions, as a means of sending his gospel ambassadors into the world. Now, it's very likely that James was written in the early 40s, so within a decade of Christ's death and resurrection. There is debate on whether or not it was written before Galatians. Galatians tends to be viewed as really early. Um, I think there's good argument that James was written first rather than Galatians when it comes to the New Testament. Either way, though, James was a leader. He was a leader in the early church in Jerusalem. So he's writing to these Christians. They are scattered abroad. They are suffering persecution. And interestingly enough, he wastes no time on, on the subject, getting to the point. What is faith? What does faith look like? How does, 
How does the law of liberty, language he'll use later, how does it work itself out? In light of all this chaos, what does faith look like? How does the law of liberty work out, especially in trials, especially when temptations tend to beset us? What would you, think about it, what would you tell people who have walked away from all of the symbols that they had ever known? They walked away from the temple in Jerusalem. I mean, that was the cornerstone of their faith. And I use that word carefully because Jesus is the cornerstone and there's a play on words there. But that was for them central. The temple was central. What would you say to people who walked away from that system? What would you say to people who, who thought that the land of Israel was at one time more important than the rest of the world? Talking to you dispensationalists, I know none of you are, but if you were something to consider. What might you tell people who, who quite literally risked it all, they, including their lives, they risked it all to follow Jesus the Messiah and advance his kingdom? What might you say to them? And, and of course, given the hostility from those who hate the gospel, how might you con- comfort these people during these trials? What would you say? Because if anyone back then, I think, was like many of Christians today, the moment that we see a trial or a tribulation or even a slight deviation from what we think ought to be, we shy away from any theology that might suggest that God is actually using it for something and that God expects something from us while we are going through it. I am preaching to myself so hard today. Any theology well, you're just suffering, you know, it's a sinful world and there's no purpose behind it. No, 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 no. Why do we shy away from that? What if, it, what if God is actually in this trial, not only in the trial, but he's comforting you and doing something with it, and he wants you to do something with it too? So these are the questions that James, of course, wrestles with. And the main idea that, that's woven throughout the letter is this. The law of liberty roots out all vestiges of hypocrisy in our lives. It's a law of liberty, and what we presuppose by calling it a law of liberty is that it presupposes all the slavery, the hypocrisy, all the things like sin and you you, you name it, all of the hypocrisy in our lives. God's law, through the power of the Holy Spirit, chases it away. It chases away the hypocrisy, and this is simply another way of describing sanctification. So the focus here in the first part of the chapter is centered on faith as it pertains to patience and wisdom. Faith works. Faith and works is going to be explored throughout the whole letter, basically. But I think the point is clear from the beginning here. What does faith look like in the face of trials? What does faith look like in the face of suffering? When things aren't going the way you think they should? What does faith look like? Living in a world where people hate God, they suppress the truth and unrighteousness, and they actively work against the Christian gospel, what, what might faith do? The recipe, of course, James says, for faith is one part patience and one part wisdom. Uh, mathematically, it would look like this. Faith equals patience plus wisdom. Because we can't just pietistically tell people, oh, just you know, suck it up, buttercup, go and pray in the closet. That, maybe you need to do that, but... <laughs> That's not entirely helpful. Faith does something. Faith looks like patience and it looks like wisdom. See, learning to pattern our lives after the wisdom and patience of God is what living, active, God-given faith looks like. Learning to pattern our lives after wisdom and, and after the wisdom and patience of God, he possesses both, he is both is what living, active, God-giving faith looks like. So the the type of faith that God gives looks a whole lot like gold being purified or metal being molded or shaped. That's faith. And, And the process of the refinement of faith includes trials. Now, the the Greek word used here in your text for for the trials is actually the same exact Greek word in verse 12 to talk about temptation. Now, trials and so trials and temptations are simply the same Greek word, right? But they have different meanings, of course. Same word, different meanings, depending on the context. Trials, we are told, 
we know come from God. Trials come from God. Temptations, James explains, do not. God does not tempt us. Right? So it's the idea of when Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Who did the tempting? Well, it wasn't God. It was the devil. But who was doing the testing? It was God. There's a, there's a nuance there. There's difference. So trials, and the reason trials come from God is because trials serve a, the purposes of God. Trials have a reason and a purpose, and all of it stems from God. But there's one thing we need to understand, and, and please get this, because much of, I think, Christi- Christianity doesn't understand this. Trials are not random, and this is because life is not random. Trials are not random, and that's because life itself isn't random. We do not live in a random universe built on chance and fate, which is what most, probably most Americans think. I would even argue many Christians are, are in that boat. Just look at the, the Ligonier study on theology, and you, uh, that proves my point. We live in a personal universe created by a personal God who orchestrates rather meticulously the movement of every molecule and atom. God orchestrates everything meticulously. So so there's a reason and a purpose that stems from an intelligible God behind all circumstances, all trials, all processes. The way the world works is because God makes it work that way. And as good Calvinists, we can say that God ordains all of your free decisions. You may have a trial right now because of your own doing. We can call that like a self-inflicted trial. And God says, all right, here we go. (laughs) But it may not be self-inflicted. It may mean that there is an aspect to your life that you don't see. Because how could we see it all? We're not omniscient towards ourselves or others, obviously. But there may be something that God wants to use to, to refine you. So God ordains all of your free decisions, and that's not a problem for us because it's not a problem for the Bible. And the question we have to ask then is this, what is the reason? What is the purpose? What is the purpose of the trial? And the answer is, he, he basically tells us, it's wrapped up in the sovereignty of God and his intentions for us. The, the, reason, the main reason that trials exist is to produce endurance. So we should consider trials to be a joy. Joy comes from God too. Because the point of the trial is to create endurance in us, steadfastness in us. We are to have, as I mentioned earlier, a hopeful obstinance towards circumstances and suffering. When we are suffering and experience unruly, obstreperous, difficult situations, we're supposed to be obstinate in our pursuit of joy, in our pursuit of of hope. So the, the point of the trial is maturity and growth. That's why it exists. We cannot expect to mature and grow if our maturity and growth remains unchallenged, unproved, and untested. Does that make sense? See, blacksmiths will never create a sword worth anything in battle unless they smash with a hammer the glowing white-hot steel on the anvil. It's never going to be worth anything. Your life is a sword being walloped on the anvil of God's sovereignty. That's what it looks like. That's what trials do. And I don't like being walloped. (laughs) It's difficult. It's frustrating. But if we have a correct understanding of the sovereignty of God and his intentions, then it's you can endure. You can grow, you can mature, you can see the trial for what it is. You, guess what? It's your turn to get on the anvil. And what James commands us to do is consider this process a joy, which is the last thing I ever want to consider a trial. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the last thing. That's why he says you should do it. Because it ought to be the first thing. We are to consider trials as being worthy things in which we place our joy. Trials, they ought to be a considered occasion. They should be considered an occasion for spirit-given, quieted contentment. An occasion for joy because you have the vision of God, not the vision of self. They ought to be considered an occasion 
for spirit-given, quieted contentment. That's the point of the trial. So when a test comes, we must consider it an opportunity for rejoicing. Okay? So, it's, I've, we've been at this for two years, and uh, the instability of things like money and unsure, you know, what's going to happen the next month and all of these things, I have to tell you, <laughs> Um, I don't usually think of it as an occasion for rejoicing. <laughs> um, I just don't. <laughs> it's usually an occasion for bickering, whining, complaining, and or, this is what I'm really good at, intellectually justifying my outrage. And uh, there is a place for biblical lament. <laughs> but sometimes... That's actually just covert complaining, which the Bible tells us to run away from. So we have to be patient with the process. We, we do. The, the endurance gives way to maturity and growth, but not if we circumvent the process, nor if we are impatient with it. A, a dulled, unfinished sword will do nothing in battle. It will do nothing in battle. So rather than panic, be patient Wait, stand firm, hold your ground, do not be dismayed, do not, do not be, don't, don't go too far down the road of despondency. Consider it a joy. Don't be the wave, he says, be an anchor. And we should keep this in mind because our enrollment in the school of Christ comes, of course, with classes on how to develop patience. And I've always said this, if you want to especially now that we live in the suburbs, if you will, of, of Babylon. <laughs> uh, you, wanna, you want to ask for patience, be prepared to sit in a traffic jam. You know, it's like, and then you get in one and you're like, you're funny, Lord, that's funny. Nice job. Good one. But that's a class. It's not an easy class, but it's a prerequisite to joy and maturity. It's a necessary class for Christians. And that means that God, though, we know that God wants us to succeed in ascertaining patience and wisdom in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the suffering. He wants us to pass the class. He, not just pass the class. He wants you to ace the class. Pass it with flying colors. God wants his swords sharpened for battle. Just know that sharpening hurts. <clears throat> Trials serve a purpose. It's the training ground. It's the training ground for endurance and maturity. And, and given this understanding, we're told to count it as joy. It is not the hopeless pagan worldview of randomness, impersonality, fate, right? Chance. Things are, well, that you're suffering. Well, that's just because we're all evolved pawn gunk and, you know, so what? But there's a problem that we all face. Trials do not make sense to us. Trials do not make sense to us. If our theology isn't straight, then we will see them as a random act of violence on our person. Are you not outraged when you have a trial and you don't see it as something from God and you think that it's a situation that someone is violently afflicted upon you and you are you're just outraged because of it? See, if our rock-solid theology of God's sovereignty isn't in place, we'll see the trials as coming from the hand of this nebulous, impersonal fate that pagans worship. And James, of course, he anticipates this thinking because he's smart. So he assumes that the antidote to this wrong-headed thinking about trials is going to require wisdom. Isn't it interesting? Why would he, why would he say that? Consider trials a joy because it gives you endurance. What? <laughs> oh, you don't understand? You're probably going to need to ask for wisdom. You have to ask God for wisdom in the trial. You're going to need the God who is wisdom to guide you by his spirit and direct you and comfort you. You're going to need to see the beating that you are taking on the anvil of God's sovereignty as being from the hand of God who has a purpose in it all. So how else, how else will we deal with this great reality of death? It's one of my favorite things when we're, uh, whether at George Mason, wherever we're at on the streets, do, try to get an unbeliever to deal with death. 
how do you deal with this? Because it exists, and they know it exists. But how do you, if you don't have the sovereignty of God, even in death, you have nothing. You have randomness. You have oopsie daisies, to quote a meme about Joel Osteen. Not sin, oopsie daisies. <laughs> So how do you deal with death? So and don't and don't ask for wisdom, you know, on which house should I buy or which which car should I buy? Don't ask for wisdom in those things if you're going to ignore wisdom and how to patiently endure trials that come your way. And the reason is because that type of approach it basically treats God as if he merely exists to help you get what you want. That's the sword who's unsharpened looking around. I would like that sheath over there. I would prefer this person over there. No, 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 no. Don't circumvent the process. We need to ask God for wisdom in all the right places. And we need to start and take seriously Proverbs 1, 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. We're going to need to think clearly about the trial. We need to ask God for wisdom. And then we're going to need to know that God promises to give it to us. He doesn't ask just so he can see you beg him. Ha <laughs> ha, look at that, he's begging. No, no, he wants you to ask because he wants to give it to you. He's not bothered by the request. He wants the request. So friends, ask him. Ask for wisdom and how to deal with the difficulties you are experiencing right now. Ask God for wisdom and how to treat the, this person during a difficult time. Whatever the situation, ask God for wisdom and how to mature enough to handle your emotions as the proper way, as we've looked at recently. But by all means, ask God. But, but James says there's an element to the asking that we need to keep in mind. And he says in verse 6, we have to ask in faith, which is not a proof text for the name it and claim it brigade. Ask in faith. And I take this to mean that there is a way to ask for wisdom that is not done in faith. And lo and behold, James tells us what that looks like. And in verse 6, the faithless person doubts. The faithless person doubts. He's like the surf or the waves. He's like the waves, which are under, under the control and direction of the wind. Waves do not just come together, have a meeting, and decide to be big and then rush the you know, beach. Waves are under the control and direction. They move about in their being at the behest of the wind. So, in other words, the point James is saying is waves are passive recipients, not active participants. That's what a faithless person is. Waves have no stability. They are liquids which are told which way to go. That's what they do. They aren't ships of faith that navigate the waters. They are the waters. That's what a faithless, doubting, double-minded person is. And this type of man, James 1.7 says, ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Why would a faithless person not expect to receive anything from the Lord? Because he's un. He's unstable. He's double-minded in all of his ways. His life is marked by instability and wishy-washy behavior. He cannot let his yes be yes and his no be no. He is quite literally going with the flow, which means that his, his loyalties are divided. He, he doesn't have a heart full of faith and trust in God. He has, ha, has a heart half full of faith and trust in God. And the other half is actually consumed by himself and the world. That's a double-minded man. He has to be told what to do because he, he's unable to act in the world with full faithfulness. This person, he, he wants the portions of God that, that he wants while leaving out the others. He's a buffet-style Christian, we could call him. He wants the grace of God, but he doesn't want the accountability to the law of God. That's a double-minded person. He wants the mercy of God, but he doesn't want the justice of God for his neighbors. Is there not a more hypocritical stance of the American church today? They want the mercy of God, but they don't want the justice of God for their neighbors. He wants, he wants to be able to pray. But the double-minded man, he, he wants it whenever he wants it. You know, this person, she can't handle the trial because she doesn't see that she's the one that's contributing to the problem. She wants mercy, but she's really hesitant to dole it out for others. 
See, this person is a pietist Peter who kicks and screams against God's law order. Kicks and screams. I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. How much do you love it? I keep it to myself. That's how much I love it. In short, the double-minded man is looking for an excuse to circumvent God's patented system for developing maturity. And do we not have that problem in our churches today? We circumvent God's pattern for the pursuit of justice, the pursuit of righteousness, right? the pursuit of holiness, the pursuit of, of things in the trial, if you will, and we circumvent it all. See, the faithless person looks at the trial not with joy and hope for future maturity and endurance, but with disdain and pride, with immaturity and fruitlessness. And David says in Psalm 119, 113, mark this. And you can put it on a Facebook post without the verse and see what happens. <laughs> I hate those who are double-minded, but I love your law. That's David's position. Proverbs 25, 26 says, Like a trampled spring in, the pollute, in a polluted well is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. That's double-mindedness. Double-mindedness is a quick risk with no long-term progress. Having a divided heart with divided loyalties will come out when you go through trials. It will prove you will either stay on the anvil and you will endure, or it will break and you will break under the pressure. And then you'll be useless. See, when suffering comes, you will either count it joy, you will learn endurance and mature, or you will falter under the weight because your faith was actually found to be dead. You simply cannot approach God with a divided heart. You can't serve two masters. In the midst of a trial, we must be resolute in asking God for wisdom, which means that faith must be the anchor of your soul. Otherwise, you're going to float around in the sea like an empty soda can in the middle of the Atlantic. Not sure where you're going, no direction, just happy to be on the ride. If your life is marked by insta instability, chaos, bickering, constant disorderliness, you might need to check your heart. We are not supposed to be the type of Christians who are just trying to survive in this otherwise broken down, the status or ruling the hen house world, right? We're just trying to make it to the weekend. Our lives are meant to count. The, the quiet daily witness of our faithful trust in God is meant to be the anchor of your soul. The world is, is constantly shifting. The cultural milieu we live in is always going to be unstable because it's built on sand, not the rock of Christ. But it's not so to be, it is not to be so with you. See, life isn't this mixed bag of random events given by an impersonal universe, you know, otherwise known, to, known as the man to whom you're supposed to stick it. <laughs> no, storms and trials come, come to us from the sovereign hand of God, and this is because inside of us, God wants patience and wisdom and growth. God desires your life to be marked by maturity. This is faith. We should be resolute in our study of God's Word. Resolute. Read the Bible, read books, chase after it. Beg God for wisdom along the way. That's what Christianity looks like. Pursuing the world. Chasing down the world. And, of course, James is going to tell us more about faith in the next passage. Remember, faith equals patience and wisdom in the trial, in the suffering, in the difficulty. Let's pray. Father, I confess that, uh, that having to study and, and share this message has been a, a difficulty. <laughs> um, but I pray, God, that your spirit would use it and that we would be encouraged and spurred on. And uh, God, what we want is more greater obedience, greater consistency. And Father, I pray that we would... Uh, not be double-minded, that we would not be half full of faith and half full of self-righteousness. So, Father, would you give us, give us the wisdom? God, we are asking for it.
wisdom in the trial, wisdom in life, God, as we are seeking to participate in your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. So would you, would you help us? It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.